G'day, I'm Patrick from Douglas Fur Design. Welcome to the Router Bits. A friend of mine was looking to buy a Lazy Susan, but he couldn't find one big enough that he liked. And I thought since we're doing all these videos on router bits, I might as well make one. We can show you the process and some of the bits that you might use to make it. Um, one of the most important bits is the actual ringed bearings that you need to have a spinning component. And I just grabbed this at Timbercon. Don't know if this is the largest one, it's 450 mils across, but they have smaller ones as well. And the actual um, piece of round timber that we're going to use is going to be about 750 mils across. Alrighty, because this project involves a bunch of different steps, uh, I'll try and show you in a bit of detail how each of those are done. What we have to do is join these panels of timber together first, and there's a router bit that I'm using to do that. Then we're going to cut the circle out using a circle cutting jig with the router. We'll then be dressing the edge to make it really nice and smooth and actually putting a bevel on the underside and a little tiny lip to, so you can put your fingers in there. I'll then be uh, sanding and finishing this with a burnishing brush before mounting it onto this ring. Uh, and yeah, we'll walk through that process now and I'll have to film it over a couple days to let the glue dry and the oil dry and that sort of thing. But we'll um, start with joining these panels together. So I'm making this whole thing out of 19 mil Tassie oak. So the first thing I did was buy enough timber to make a square, uh, which is 800 by 800. If you're trying to be really frugal with timber, you can make these end bits shorter because we're not going to use all of them. But for the sake of the few dollars of extra timber, I'm just going to make it square. All of these we're going to join together using a glue joint bit, which is a really handy router bit that I have done a full video on. So if you want a bit more detail, you can check that out. But basically all it does is with one router bit allows you to do a really neat joint that's very strong with lots of glue surface area. When you use this bit, the first bit goes through uh, with the face side up and the second bit goes through with the face side down. So you need to lay all of your pieces out, number them so they stay in order and then mark a up, down, up, down, up, down so that you know when you're using your router table which side is which and you don't get them mixed up. So now that I've got all the, uh, the router joints cut on these, I'm going to glue up these panels and I'll be using these panel clamps to do it. First I've got to put some glue on the, each of the joints though. So what I'm going to do is put each of these bits on edge, put them next to each other and I'll clamp them together so they don't fall over because that's kind of what they want to do. This is just an easy way to put glue on lots of surfaces at once without having to do each one individually that I found. Um, alrighty. So it's really important that you give this a brush off, make sure there's no sawdust or bits and pieces in there because that can stop those joints coming together really nice and tight later on. Now that I have all of these exposed edges, I am going to lay a bunch of glue in there and then I'm going to use a little off cut with that glue joint profile that's, that matches these to run through each one of these joins and just make sure that the glue is spread really evenly. Then I'll lay these out and clamp them all together like that. All right, so I did all the glue on one side of the boards. I flipped over the center ones so that I can put a bit of glue on the other side of those joins as well. You might be able to get away with just gluing one side of the join, but with glue, I always prefer to have a little bit more than a little bit less because uh, you can always just wipe it off later. And it's better having a nice strong joint. There's a lot of surface area in these joins, so you want to make sure that there's a lot of glue to fill it. So day two of the Lazy Susan video, took all of these out of the clamps, uh, gave them a quick sand 
decided which was my top and my bottom side. From here on out, we're actually gonna be working from the underneath um, for a couple of reasons. I've just placed this on a couple of these little tri grips to hold it off the table and that's going to allow me to use a router bit that actually comes slightly below the timber without digging into the table. So we're going to be using a circle jig to cut this out but basically to use the jig we have to place, drill a small hole and put a screw in the dead centre of this um, circle and that's why I want to do it from the underside so I don't have that little mark on the top side that I'm going to be seeing all the time. So first of all, I had to find the exact centre of this big slab that I've created and I did that by just um, using a large ruler and going from corner to corner, marking the point where that intersects. I then used a um, basically a large compass, but you could use a piece of string and a nail or any method to do this. I placed that on my centre point and marked that circle the whole way around and made sure that it was within the edges of my slab of timber here. So now what we need to do is set up this circle jig to uh, cut, this, cut this circle out perfectly. We'll do it in a few passes. We're not gonna cut through the full 19 mil in one go. Uh, and uh, I'll just go through that process now. Circle guide kit comes with a few bits. It uses the uh, Milescraft turn lock base plate, which it comes with it, so you don't need to buy that separately. Basically what this allows you to do is lock your router into a number of different devices such as the circle guide kit in a really simple and quick way. Um, so you've got your base plate which you have to put onto your router, There's plenty of good instructions in the box to do that. Then you've got this uh, circle guide base plate, you've got your big aluminium ruler, that goes together, you basically use that to create the radius. And it also has this nifty little one which allows you to do smaller circles as well. So this circle guide kit actually comes with a little router bit uh, which will work perfectly with it. It's a quarter inch router bit and it gives you an accurate measurement of the inside and the outside of the cut, which is really handy. For this Lazy Susan that I'm making, I'd really like to do this cut with a spiral up cut bit. I think the cut will be cleaner, I think it'll be a little bit faster but the disadvantage is I don't get the accuracy of the inside and the outside cut measurement, so I'm just gonna have to um, place that myself. It's actually really simple, but I just wanted to let you know that that is a feature which comes with it. For this Lazy Susan, the first thing we need to do, obviously, is mark the center point, because that's gonna be the point at which this whole apparatus revolves around. I've done that just by um, drawing across from the corners, and then I've drawn my circle really quickly using a compass so that I know that it's gonna fit inside this uh, 800 by 800 board that I've created. I get that little base plate, I place it over my center. I'm gonna pre-drill a tiny hole there and just use this little screw which comes with it to locate that in place. Now, I'm doing all of this from the bottom of the piece that I'm working on, in this case, the Lazy Susan, because I don't wanna have that little hole in the top of my Lazy Susan when it's finished. That's also why I'm going to use this little spiral up cut here because it'll mean that the cleanest edge of my cut is actually going to be on the opposite side that I'm working, which when I flip it over will be the top side of this piece. All right, putting a little pilot hole in the center. Doesn't need to go in very far. They actually throw a little drill bit in the kit too, which is handy. Put my little screw through that nipple. and that's on there, sturdy, perfectly in the center. So this little black piece of the apparatus has a circle in the bottom and that gets located onto our little red center locator there. And then we place our circle guide base plate onto the ruler itself, making sure that we engage the uh, little metal uh, T-slot piece and that locks in place there and basically what this allows us to do is set this at any, any length that we want, lock that off, place our router in there and we'll do our circle in a couple of passes 
As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to use a little spiral upcut bit for this for this circle. The reason I want to use this as opposed to a um, standard straight bit is that it just gives me a really smooth cut and it especially gives me a really smooth face on the lower side and that's the face that I want to keep perfectly square when I've actually finished this, this uh, Lazy Susan. I've locked the circle base onto the ruler. This main pivot is still sliding because we need to adjust that later. I've put the, uh, the router bit tucked just below the height of the base plate because I don't want it scratching the surface right now. And I'm going to put the base plate into this uh, circle base. That's just a matter of lining up these little arrows with the uh, circle base, turning it until it locks. It's dead simple. Um, now what we want to do is just uh, lower that route a bit so it's almost touching the table. Slide this along until we're happy that the router bit is just on the outside of the line and then we're basically ready to cut. And so what we'll do is raise the router bit by just uh, two or three mils for our first pass, lock this off at exactly the right length and then we'll get going. So we'll do a few mils at a time until we go through this 19 mil stop. The spiral bit did its job. We went through about, uh, I think it was four passes. Uh, but I'd like to do one more pass around the whole edge, now that I'm not actually cutting through material, just to take half a mil off the entire thing and hopefully get that edge a little bit smoother while the bit isn't kind of bumping along trying to actually cut through stock on both sides. So all I'll do is uh, pull this radius in by uh, a little bit less than a mil, hopefully, and then run around again Hopefully that'll just shave off enough to give me a really smooth edge. Okay, so that, that last pass just really improved the quality of this cut, so I think that's probably an, a necessary step. What I had to do to get that route a bit engaged with the edge, just the tiny amount that I needed, is actually start with this unlocked, with the router bit just off the edge, and then while firmly holding the router, just bring it in so it just touches and you'll be able to hear it, lock it off and then go around. Because you can't start the router up when the bit is engaged, because it'll act as a gear and uh, either rip the timber or just not a good thing to do. The great thing about this is with my center point located here, is I can then use the exact same setup to cut a chamfer around this if I wanted that or some other kind of decorative profile. You could move it in and do a uh, finger grip or some other decorative feature or shadow line on this board as well. So there's a lot of possibilities for using this thing and it's pretty simple to use. Now that we've cut out our circle for the Lazy Susan, I actually want to put a um, uh, 45 degree chamfer on the bottom edge, just uh, soften the look a bit create a slightly different profile. Because we've already cut a perfectly smooth circle, you could just do this with a handheld router, with a chamfer bit, uh, with a bearing, but because I've got the circle jig set up, I'm gonna actually just put the chamfer bit into the circle bit, into the circle jig and go around. Um, I'll probably do it in a couple passes so that I'm not taking off too much material at one time and I can really fine tune how deep I want that chamfer. Now that I've done my chamfer, I just want to put a uh, small finger groove on the underside here, about uh, five or 10 mil back from the chamfer. And I'm going to do that with a round nose plunge bit. So all I'm going to do is throw that in the router, drop this um, device circle cutting guide back uh, by about five mil to place this exactly where I want it. Plunge this down by about, um, by about five mil, I think. And we'll do one, should be able to do it in one pass. And it'll just give you something to grab onto on the underside of the table when you're trying to turn this. All right, 
Alrighty, I've uh, given this a really good sand, uh, down to about 800 grit on the top surface that we're going to use, and uh, just down to about 240 on this bottom surface, which no one should really be looking at or touching anyway, but still feels great. Uh, as you can see, we've chamfered the edge, put that little um, finger groove along the bottom, which will just make it a bit nicer to turn. And I'm just going to apply some oil. I've decided to use this um, Organ Oil Hard Burnishing Oil. Uh, I haven't used it a lot before, but one of my woodworking buddies uh, has been showing me what he's been doing with it, and I want to give it a shot. It's a little bit different from what I normally use. Um, there are a couple different methods of application on the back, but this is just one way you can do it. It doesn't actually follow the directions on the back super closely, but just make sure when you're messing around with it, do a couple test pieces and see how you like to use it. The way that I've been told and uh, that I, I enjoy using it is just to brush some onto the surface fairly liberally, make sure it's all covered, and then use one of these um, burnishing brushes on your drill at fairly high speed and you go over the entire surface while the oil is still wet. It's not a true burnish because it's not using the sandpaper to create a slurry, but the heat and the friction from the brush actually helps the um, tongue oil in the burnishing oil go off really quickly and it gives you a super smooth finish that is dry basically as soon as you're finished with the drill. So you can then wait a little bit, put some more on and actually have a finished piece done without having to wait days for oil to dry or waiting to do the next coat the next day. So it's a really nice uh, way to apply oil really quickly and uh, that's what, one of the best benefits I think of this product. So I'm actually just going to um, pour a bit of this on and then brush it all out evenly, making sure it's in the grooves and so forth and right along the edge there, letting plenty soak into that end grain. One of the advantages of using this burnishing brush rather than using a burnishing sanding pad is it actually is soft and it will um, contour into those soft edges, which might be incredibly difficult to do if you're trying to burnish using a traditional sanding method. All right, so I'm ready to start using the burnishing brush. Basically, you just go all over. You'll see it as it slightly dries. Uh, I don't think you can do it too much. We'll be doing a second coat anyway. I'll be wearing eye protection because it will be flipping a bit of oil around. So, um, get started. Alright, so I put one coat on and spent about 10 minutes with the burnishing brush and it just came up beautifully. It's so smooth. All of that excess oil is gone and the heat has helped it to soak in and basically cure about halfway. Um, and I'm ready to do another coat now and go through the same process. If you wanted a, problem, a slightly um, thicker uh, oil coverage on the finished product, you could let this dry for a bit longer, maybe leave it overnight and do that burnishing process again. But I really wanted this um, very light oil look. I don't want a really thick polyurethane feel, not that the burnishing oil will ever quite get that thick. So I'm ready to just do another one now. So we've taken this Lazy Susan from those panels being glued up to basically being a finished product that we can take home uh, in one day. And without this brush, that just kind of isn't possible. You can't get oil or any kind of finish to dry that quickly. It's uh, be ready to, um, ready to move on to the next step in, in, in any other way without using this. That's why it's so fantastic. Uh, so it works really well with this hard burnishing oil, but um, I'd actually really like to give it a shot with a few other or it finishes like Danish oil and see how it reacts. I imagine that we'd have a, a pretty pretty similar effect. But it has a lovely sheen. You can um, you can already touch it, even though we only applied it uh, you know about 10 minutes ago. And that's that's pretty advantageous in a workshop like this when if I have wet furniture lying around, getting dust and other crud all over it, well that really sets me back. So this has been um, great great piece of equipment. So we finished burnishing this, looks fantastic. We're basically ready to put the hardware on now. So I'll flip it upside down and I'll show you how to locate this, um, this bearing ring on the underside. 
I'm just going to put some pieces of fabric down underneath um, because I don't really want this sitting on my piece of rubber here. Who knows what other crud is on that rubber. I don't want to mark our fresh surface. Alright, so underneath here we have the dead centre because that's what we use to cut the outer circle. So that'll be one reference and we just need to mark the dead centre of this piece of equipment and the way I'm going to do that is by using some masking tape and putting some tape between each one of those holes and that will give me a centre mark. I'll just put it on and then give you a bit better of an explanation. Okay, so what I did was place a piece of tape from hole to hole on each of these six holes and I laid the tape over the direct, the direct center of each hole. So one edge of each piece of tape is my reference and where they all three line up is the dead center of this circle. So now that I know where the center of that is, flip it upside down because uh, that's how it needs to be mounted onto this piece of timber. Place the center of my tape over that center of the nail hole and now we know this is exactly where it needs to be. We can screw those in. I'm going to do a little pilot hole because I don't want the timber to crack. Um, so I'll actually just drop a, um, an awl or a nail down each one of those to mark where I want those holes. I'll do a slight pilot hole and then I can put it back in place and screw it in. Drilled my holes, take that tape off, don't need it there anymore. Place this over those holes. And they line up, excellent. So I've got three little screws here and I've made sure that the um, once they protrude through this metal ring, they're not gonna be long enough to push through the other side of the timber. That's really important, otherwise you'll have screws sticking out of the good side, which is no good. Uh, so we're ready to just screw them in. So, that's exactly where it needs to be. It turns perfectly. We're pretty much done. Here's our 800 millimeter custom made Lazy Susan, ready to go home.